Hi, can everyone hear me? Perfect. My name is Caitlin Cruikshank. I work with Makers Place, which is a digital art marketplace. Um, and I have an amazing group of artists up here with me today, all of them who have artwork in the Makers Place booth downstairs. It's just outside the entrance of the, makers, or the VIP section, so make sure to stop by and take a look at the art and come and say hello to the artists afterwards. I'm going to give short introductions so that we can just kind of dive into conversation, um, but I'll be introducing everyone briefly now. So at the far side, we have Thank You X, who's a painter from Los Angeles. He began his artistic career in 2009, expanded his artistic practice to include digital art in 2020. How am I doing? So well, so far so good. Um, he's had great success in the market recently. He's had some incredible collaborations with people like Hans Zimmer, an amazing solo show at the Sotheby's office in LA recently, um, and a sold out Bitcoin's Ordinal collection recently. You even sent a painting to space, I think, last year. <laughs> Um, next to Thank You X is Jenny Pisanen, who is Finnish and has an unbelievably beautiful picture from her Mask Obscura series on display downstairs. It's my personal favorite from the series, so I'm excited to ask you more about it. Jenny does a lot of work with AI and GAN. She has a beautiful kind of neo-surrealism aesthetic to her work. Really excited to dive in and to hear your thoughts today. We've got Osanachi who is a leading African um, digital artist. We've been working together for a few years now, and I absolutely adore Osanachi. He started um, selling his digital artworks in 2017, um, and his art really dives into and confronts stereotypes, especially for um, Africans in contemporary society. Um, thank you so much for being a, here with us today, and I know you've had a lot of travel, crazy travel to get here, so uh, good job making it. And finally, last but not least, we have Mar Mario Klingman, who is the uh, earlier, I feel like the Bado Dao team members who are here were calling you the father of Bado, which is very true. Uh, German artist, um, has had one of the Google residencies, an absolute pioneer in, in the digital space. Um, we're thrilled to have you here with us today as well. So I thought to start, we could maybe just hear from each of you guys a little bit about the pieces that you have here today. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, emotion and the artist's curation in their artwork specifically. We've got a really interesting representation of artworks from each of the artists in the booth. So Ryan, do you want to start and just talk a little bit about Alchemy of Time? Yeah, sure. How's it going, Paris? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the piece downstairs called Alchemy of Time, it's um, the simple answer is that it's just, uh, you know, collecting these little moments and big, uh, making them in something bigger and, um, yeah, holding on to that moment. And instead of it just being like something fleeting, you just keep adding up those wins and then it becomes something that's like a bigger feeling that you, you know, maybe never forget. And sometimes you do forget and then you have to rebuild again. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece, really emotionally driven. Um, I, I'm absolutely in love with it. So anyone who has questions about it, come and talk to me. Ryan knows I could just go on and on and on about it. Yeah, for me, it's a personal piece because it's, like, it's, it's highly conceptual. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm making a painting, it's like maybe the, the meaning comes later sometimes or halfway through. But this one was like very conceptual from like the idea to every little element of it. And uh, aesthetically, the aesthetic came you know, after. So it's like, you know, when I'm painting, it's aesthetic. I'm just painting something and then I start to feel something. Yeah. This one was like a full, you know, orchestrated thing yeah. from it's, the start. It's like narratively driven, but also it's like the, the emotion that you put into it, that was the starting place, which is, which is so interesting. And a little bit of what I'd love for the rest of you to talk about also is the emotion in your artwork. Jenny, with your series with Mask Obscura, you have, we have war on display downstairs, which has a bright red kind of central color to it. It's so different than a lot of the other works from the series. What was it like titling your pieces, getting the group of the series for Mask Obscura together? Did you have kind of a specific feeling or emotion tied for each one as you were creating it, or did that come afterwards? Yeah, so the Mask Ob Obscura series is uh, 24 pieces, and the four last ones are The War, and Conquest, uh, Famine, and Death. So those pieces are the final of the series. and. 
all of the pieces, 24, I created in the, like, first, like, I made them, like, ready. And when as I was going, I was, like, tweaking and changing them, so they kind of evolved as they were going. And the war piece, uh, it was always, like, idea to make it, like, the red and, like, really, like, how do you say, uh, dangerous looking as it's yeah. about the war. It feels aggressive almost in a way like you there's also I think the bright red against the muted grays in the background of the piece is it's really in stark contrast also to a lot of the other figures in the series which are all significantly more muted um, which Ryan even with your piece also it's like the colors are actually very calming there are, you see like your kind of signature color palette um, but how does even choosing then the selecting of colors kind of connect with emotion? Because it feels like both of you guys really specifically thought about the colors coming into the pieces and that color reflecting the emotional message you wanted people to have from it. Yeah, so the red one is, was one of, one of the, like, the first pieces I generated uh, in a way because I make these chapter shapes with the GAN. So they don't really res resemble anything, but when I saw it, I was like, okay, this fits perfectly for this war category, and then I chose that piece for it. So it's kind of like, how do you say, gut feeling yeah. that you choose. Yeah. For me, like, the color palette I use is like, very important. It's like the specific reds. I mean, for me, like, you know, like you're saying, like, red, is, red evokes emotion, yeah. whether that's like power, you know, love, sometimes hate, you know, just like a it's a strong feeling and different people will have different reactions to it. Um, so red is like one of my the main colors I always use, you know? Yeah, yeah. I love the gilt, the gold that flecks and kind of specks through your pieces too. It's so beautiful. Um, and Osanachi, you have Laundry Day, which is a favorite artwork of mine, of yours. Um, it's on display in the booth. You also have like in incredibly specific and intentional color palette, but also textures to the colors in your piece, which I love seeing when digital art um, really pulls into kind of a, a, a 3D element. And that, that kind of texture to each of the layers feels so carefully chosen. With Laundry Day, did you start with the composition? Or you also have a strong narrative behind that piece. Did you start with the, the narrative first? Yeah, um, I started with the composition first. Um, I just wanted to make an artwork uh, that had someone um, just in their underwear um, with um, the washing machines, right, laundry machines right behind them. Uh, but then um, the artwork turned out to be something um, much more than that, deeper than that. Uh, it turned out to be um, a sort of um, symbol for renewal or transformation, right? Where if you have um, dirty clothing, if you have laundry, um, you have to wash them to sort of renew them and wear them back again. And you know, it's that cycle that keeps happening in the human life. Um, I, I think it's um, reflective of how we live our lives as humans, right? At some point you have to renew, at some point you have to sort of transform, um, but it is still you, it is still the same clothing, only that it is now um, clean mm -hmm. and you can wear it again. Um, there's the detergent there, there's the dirty laundry there, there's the machines turning right behind, and of course there's the subject um, that is there. And when it comes to my use of color, um, what I keep telling people is that I try things and what works, works. I mean, um, I think one advantage I have with using Microsoft Word is if the color doesn't work, I can easily change it, right? I think it's the same thing with people who are artists who work digitally. Um, and so uh, the subjects, my subjects have um, dark skin. Um, and so I want to balance things out. So where you have dark skin, I want to bring colors that sort of pop so that yeah. dark skin itself would also sort of show um, in, the, in the foreground. Uh, that's, um, that's the narrative really behind that. Yeah, and it's, it's so beautifully done. The composition is a central figure um, that's really you know, dead center and immediately eye-catching, and it feels like the entire space kind of unfolds behind him. But I love that he's, he's in his underwear, and he's, you know, he's in the laundromat, he has his clothes next to him, and you're also given that kind of reminder that to 
in this form of renewal, maybe when reviewing and assessing your life, you need to strip down to the essentials to, yeah. to really kind of think about what's important in life and, yeah. and what you need to pull together. For, for me, that's usually um, uh, close to my birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then um, I'm very much interested in the figure. My work is figurative, right? I'm interested in the figure. I'm interested in the pose because the pose also means something. That pose you see there with the guy in the laundromat, it, it, it means submission. It's a sort of submission to this process of renewal. There is no fighting back. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. You mentioned something earlier that also made me pull a connection um, to Thank You X's piece. Is you, you guys both actually, in very different ways, because yours is very figural, you've got like a beautiful interior scene that is instantly recognizable. And Thank You X, your piece is, it's significantly more abstract than that. But both of you are actually thinking about this process, this cyclicality of thinking about your life, what's important, um, the idea of renewal, the idea of kind of trying to focus on the positives of your lives and the sense of wholeness and unity that that can kind of bring you but also displayed visually in such a dramatically different way. I'm interested, did either of you, when looking at each other's work, did you have any idea that there was even like that emotional connection between the piece, or did it you know, take kind of diving into a little bit more? No, I, I didn't. I, <laughs> yeah. I think that's, what, that's what's great about art, because like, I, I like to explain my art to a certain extent, but at the same time, like you, you might see something completely different, and what you yeah. see is exactly true because that's what you're feeling from it. And so, like, I feel like sometimes if you give like every feeling that you were making while making the piece and every tiny bit of the story, I like to give like a loose outline. Yeah. But if you t if sometimes if you describe it too much, then it becomes this is what it is, and then maybe the person's like, oh, I don't connect with that, or I don't see that, or so. Um, I I like to treat it like it's a song and like I'm a songwriter yeah. and I'm writing a song and that song is special for you, that song is special for you, you and all of you, like whatever you hear with that song is the truth behind the painting. And you know, yeah. obviously there's like, a, for me there's a meaning to it. Um, and you know, I explain it poorly, but you know. You, every, you <laughs> explain it wonderfully, you really do. I mean, we when we had a, our first conversation really as I was writing the curator statement for the booth, when we were first talking, I was so inspired, but I also saw all of these pieces of the artwork that I hadn't seen before after our conversation. I mean, you know I can just keep talking and talking and talking about it. <laughs> I can't help myself. But I'm really curious, Mario, with Bado. So an autonomous machine artist, how do you think, or do you think that emotion is, is apparent and is part of Bado's artworks. How do you, it's a really interesting um, kind of idea where we have such kind of intense emotional messages in the rest of them. How do you think that comes into Bado and Bado's artworks? Well, uh, as Thank You X just said, um, it's different Art people. Art is subjective. No, no, yeah, it is subjective and sometimes People might see emotion in something that, well, the artist actually did not intend to put in there or, well, they recognize it. So I would definitely say that Botto is able to kind of get similar emotional results as a human painter would. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the end, the question is like, uh, if you do a painting and you share it on, on social media, you already digitized it. Uh, is there already some soul getting lost or are people still able to recognize it? And then kind of digitizing is just one more step to finding it in latent space. So I believe uh, kind of, yes, you can find emotion uh, within Botto's paintings, even though Botto did not intend to put them in there, but it has access to all kind of, well, to the entire kind of repertoire of yeah. uh, emotion that humanity put into artworks because that is in its training state. Huh? And so, yep. And I remember that this one, this uh, overt flow, which yeah. uh, we have those 150 prints uh, on display, uh, 
did have very strong immediate emotional reactions by the community that voted it up. It actually, it's from the Genesis period, yeah. so kind of Botto's first year, yeah. where kind of the models were still rough. And yeah. uh, it stood definitely out from what it had produced before uh, in its colors and uh, the motif. And so I th if I remember correctly, that was almost like making it in the first week, it ended in the voting pool yeah. and had a lot of uh, kind of people. And I think, yeah, it's very positive. Yeah. Actually, uh, Botto also writes his own descriptions. So, and uh, in this case, uh, it was an early GPT and well, there's this mountain range, right? And kind of almost like a picture from a road me or an illustration yeah. from, yeah. And, but the description is very humorous because it says like, this is a mountain. It doesn't want to be anything else but a mountain. <laughs> so <laughs> I really, that spoke to me. I mean, uh, so. Well, and it actually begs the question of like, step back and appreciate the landscape as a landscape, you know? Yeah, like exactly. a, beautiful, a beautiful representation of the beautiful world that's around us can be as simple as just, the aim just being that, being a beautiful piece of art, you know, not trying to be anything else. One thing I like about Botto personally is it evokes emotion. And there's an immediate reaction, no matter what, when you yeah. see it. You're either like, like obviously, you, there's backlash, and then there's like support. And I think that is, to me, that like the, both sides, the support and the backlash, become the art. Exactly. And it's just a mirror. <clears throat> what Botto creates is a mirror, and then you know, that reflects the community and all that stuff. So like, yeah. I don't know, like for me, like, obviously there's like, you know, tons of backlash, but tons of support. I fucking love it because it's just, it, it evokes emotion and that's what art is supposed to do. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's exactly what it's about. Yeah. <laughs> and also kind of the emotion of the community and uh, like there's the community that steers Botto, which has, goes through ups and downs and uh, excitement and uh, like what the uh, WTF, uh, <laughs> about, like what did Botto do there? But yeah. And then of course there's the outside world who kind of reacts to things. Well, and people like have asked me like, they're like, what do you think of Botto? Like, do you think that's art? And I'm like, you're asking me this question right now. So that's, you're, you're painting a brush stroke right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that though. It's, there is, there is an interesting, I think, um, because there's so many eyes on digital art, it's so easy now in the world that we live in to also share new creations, to put things out there for people, for things to be digested on a global scale visually so quickly that there's also perhaps more talk, more chatter than ever before. For you guys as artists, so you know we've, we've kind of covered the idea of the emotion being imbued like into the artworks themselves, but what is it like creating in the space, living in this world where every single movement, every single piece, every single kind of small snip that you put out there um, is being reviewed on a global scale across all of these social media platforms. Do you like, I mean, clearly, thank you, X, you do, when you, when, if you spark a positive and... Yeah, if it's a positive reaction, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, look, the reality is that, like, yeah, it's in no other time in history have we been able to, like, distribute something this fast and, and reach an audience. At yeah. the same time, that opens us up to, like, so much, right? Like, you, you know, you might get some haters or whatever it is, like, but um, it, like, it's very easy, but it's also very hard for an artist to, like, get to that point to want to put their art out or like, you know, like it's not like yeah. day one of painting. You're like, well, this sucks. Like, I mean, <laughs> I've been painting for like a long time and I make something I'm like, oh, I don't know if this is that good. And I put it out on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. I'm like, well, fuck it. Who cares? You know? And then, um, but you know, you get good reactions, you get maybe some bad reactions, but I think it's just part of the game. And the idea is that like, well, I created this for like myself and if people like it, that's, a huge win. If they don't like it, they just keep scrolling, you know, or leave a comment or whatever if they want. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a plus and a minus that it's easy to reach an audience. I shouldn't say it's easy because it's still hard to build up an audience, and yeah. and the stickiness of having an audience is hard because it's you know you have to connect with the audience at some point. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about so? Also, each of you guys have done a lot of curation work to some degree. I mean, the, we could talk all day just about Botto curating, and it, it's such a fascinating and interesting process, but Osnachi, you and I have worked on um, Africa Here, which is an incubator program for artists who are in Africa. You've done a lot of curatorial work also for Christie's and other areas. 
Jenny, even in the setup of the Mask Obscura series, knowing that you wanted it to be 24 images, a certain set, like the, the curation and the elements of the review and selection and the drive of putting together each of those kind of brackets of, of Mask Obscura is like intense curatorial work. And thank you, X, you've done a lot of curatorial work yourself as well. Do you feel as though, as an artist, you also, you guys are all so visually driven, um, so visually driven in so many ways. Is it easy to see yourself as a curator as well? Is it easier to kind of curate something that your group is, that your artwork isn't a part of? Or is it easier to kind of build something around what you've created and what you know and are familiar with? I, th I think, um, I, I don't know which is easier, but I know that curating is not um, easy in its entirety. Um, for me, I, I like to curate based on what speaks to me, right? Like Africa here, where we made the selections, I, th those were artworks that really um, spoke to me um, as, as an artist, as an African. Um, so uh, when it comes to curating, that is all I'm looking for, what um, speaks to me. But it's not just about what speaks to me, it's about um, what speaks to me and deserves to be seen by other people, you know, and that is the reason for spotlighting um, other artists through the curatorial work uh, that I do. Um, I co-curated um, the first NFT show at Atex Lagos, which happens every November in, in Lagos, and um, it was really beautiful. And just like Africa here, what I try to do is to reach across Africa. It's not just West Africa, it's not just East Africa, it's not just Southern Africa, but to reach across Africa because for me, I think that um, art making is um, storytelling. The artist is a medium through uh, which this uh, thing is being given to, to the world. It doesn't matter how the world sees it. But of course, um, we have shared stories and we also have unique stories to ourselves, even though we can be from the same uh, continent. And that is what I try to capture. Um, what I like to call um, a whole, um, how, how do I say it now? Like a holistic human experience, right? Um, to try to capture all of that story. So that's what I do through curation. I mean, that's a, and it, that's a beautiful way to put it, like the entirety of human existence, you know, try to put a little bit of everything, every stage of life, every period, every emotion kind of in there. Yeah, that, that effort, I think, is what is important, even though you might not succeed in capturing everything, but you have to really genuinely make that effort. Yeah. How about Bado's curation process, which is so fascinating, and maybe you can give even the group a, a short... I, I feel like everyone in this room is probably quite familiar, but a little explanation of the weekly kind of voting process. Um, I'd also love for you personally to tell me if you've, when you watch the votes, how often are you heartbroken maybe that something that you loved didn't get chosen, or what is that feeling of like happiness and pride when something that you love is selected as like the daily mint or the weekly mint? Well, you could say there the big difference between Botto and maybe like human artists that I would like uh, call real artists is that Botto tries to please, uh, whereas uh, I would say mm. true human artists mostly do what they feel they want to do and don't really care about the world. Of course, reality is that you still have to earn your living, but ideally you do not try to make something that sells, you make something that you have to do. Yeah. So, but Botto is different in that aspect that it tries to anticipate uh, what its community of uh, voters uh, prefers and doesn't like, and then present them with a new curation. Like every week it selects 350 new fragments or kind of, let's say, art in the making and uh, presents those for voting from millions of fragments it has access to and generates every time. And then, yeah, people voting on it and uh, that votes for like what they liked and what they didn't like goes back to Botto and it trains continuously its taste model to adjust better to what the humans might like. Yeah. And of course, uh, 
a lot of different motivations go into that voting process. Some people just vote by their gut feeling, others try to, again, anticipate, uh, well, this might actually sell. So, or, uh, and of course, there's positive and negative votes. And as, as you asked, like, uh, how do I feel? I mean, uh, that's definitely, Botto does often things I find uh, rather like uh, questionable or uh, that I hate to my guts. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and then, of course, and but other people love it. I, I see it in the Discord uh, when people kind of say, oh, did you see this one? And they try to get up and say, no. <laughs> so there's these internal voting yeah. battles yeah. going on where in the end, uh, like just before things get minted, you see kind of the top 15 fragments. And uh, that's the thing. It can vary between something very abstract and uh, something very kind of pretty. And, and then, well, Sometimes uh, I really say, yeah, this is it, and nobody understands it, yeah. and uh, then, so yeah, emotions going high in I that aspect. Honestly, <laughs> hearing you describe it, it makes it truly sound like a father-child relationship. Oh, yes, like you, absolutely. you have an idea of exactly where this this is going. You have. You, you're proud of it in moments. You, you, it causes you anguish in moments where you think, oh, I can't believe that you know, it has done this. But at the same time, it's like, it's something beautiful, it's created, it's, and it's its own thing. You, know? you don't control it. It's its, its own Absolutely. entity, it's And its I being. should say also, from the beginning, of course, I kind of designed the AI methods how Botto creates, and I had to watch really out that it's not replicating me, but right. that it's open to roam the space of possibilities without yeah. taking into account my personal preferences, yeah. so, which was risky because, yes, it could drift off, but then, yeah, through the steering and constant, constant learning, it goes into places that it's, it is here and it's doing well. I yeah. mean, uh, and so, yeah, something works, and it's in interesting to watch how kind of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this process is... Uh, People love love participating. It has so a life of its own. It, yeah, and that is the whole point. Yeah. Yes, and uh, hopefully, uh, an infinite life. Yeah. I mean, that is the the long term view, right? Like the first immortal artist. Let's see. I mean, let's not talk about this in Prague. Like, I mean, we all want artists to die, right? Yeah. So they <laughs> finally raise in value. But yeah, in the case of Botto, we have to work with different uh, paradigms there. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, and I come from the auction, you know, <laughs> auction industry and the auction background, and for me, it's always like the, of course, the moment that the artist is not living anymore, then that's the moment that those prices shoot up. But I love this idea of Bato being the first immortal artist. And I mean, it already is to some degree. Well, we'll, we'll wait and see. As long as it sells, the servers keep running. Yeah, right. And then <laughs> might, it might at some point go into hibernation. Yeah. But yeah, unlike humans, you can just turn it on again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Unbelievable. Amazing. What's, it, hearing you talk through the curation process, though, it's interesting because it's the total opposite of, I feel like, like Osinachi with the show that you did with Africa Here, Thank You X with your show, um, the, the Sotheby's show that you curated, or even you selected of your own works. In Bado's process, of course, it's, it's curation completely on its head. It's all of these people putting this input into one single artist, whereas oftentimes you have an artist who Osinachi, in your case, was curating with Africa Here, a huge group of many other artists, and actually, thank you, X, with even the selection of the pieces for your show in LA. Um, I'm curious to know about that process a little bit, but why don't we start with you, thank you, X. Yeah, well, I think more than my show, I think, uh, I, I really did let Sotheby's kind of like help Heck. curate that one. Yeah. Um, but I think I've done two curations for Sotheby's before where, you know, they do like the contemporary day sale, the evening sale, stuff like that. And I've done, I've helped them curate like the digital Side selection of that. Of that. There, so there'll be like, you know, 10, 15 artists of that. And going back to what you said, it's like curation is very hard. And then I think especially if you're curating something for like a Sotheby's, because it's different than just like, hey, I have a gallery or like, you know, curating somewhere like where you just want to post stuff that you really, really love. Yeah. Because when it's Sotheby's, it's like that mix of, I really, really love this, and it has a sales history that kind of like yeah. fits within this world of we all know what Sotheby's is. It's like they, they want to make money, you know? And so you kind of have to find that middle ground of like, who, who's that 
next artist who's like really crushing it themselves and like really putting in the work and they're like making a buzz, but they haven't had that like big spotlight yeah. that like I can basically be like, oh, like let me lift you up a little bit. Yeah. You know, like you're already going. You know, I'm not plucking you out of obscurity. Like I see you, we all see you, but like you just haven't had that big moment yet. And so like let me help you give that big moment. And so that's like, but it's hard because like you see a lot of people and people, once you start curating for Sotheby's, then you kind of attract people wanting to be in Sotheby's that start to reach out to you and can I be in your next sale? Like, and that stuff's hard because sometimes it doesn't work or it doesn't fit there yet, you know? And then sometimes it, you're like, holy shit, I, of course you belong here. Yeah, next one, I got you, you know? Yeah. But um, as far as my show, um, yeah, I, you know, had more pieces I could have put in the show. Yeah. But um, I sat with the Sotheby's team and we kind of just went through it and like, what's my prior history, this and that, like, what's the market at right now, and yeah. how many pieces should we put in, maybe let's do one big one instead of three small ones in that section, like, so um, that really was like a partnership with them, yeah. so um, I can't really take full credit for the curation of that sale, yeah. or the, of that um, gallery show, yeah. It's interesting thinking about both sides of it, though, kind of the, the solo artist group curation and then the group curation solo curator yeah. almost in well, that moment. The way that I got connected, with, the way that I started curating for Sotheby's is they had asked me to do a solo auction in uh, October 2021. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not ready for that yet. And so like they asked me, and I said, I'm like, no, I'll do one piece. And then how about I bring in 10 other artists? And so um, I, I'm like of the belief system of like, if you have a spotlight on you, try to help shine that on others. Yeah. And, um, you know, like when I was younger and in, in need of that spotlight, people helped shine a spotlight on me. So I want to like kind of pay that back. Yeah. Um, but also like, I just, a, I don't think I deserved a solo thing at the time. And also I just couldn't have finished something and maybe wouldn't have sold for what they probably wanted it to sell for, for a solo thing. So, um, Yeah. It's, it's interesting because those words when you said, you know, when you have a bit of spotlight on you, you want to be able to shine a light on other artists. I have almost verbatim heard you say that to me, Osanachi, before. A lot of the... That's why, that's why I love him so much. I know. You guys are really like a match made in heaven. <laughs> but with a lot of the curating that you've done, you've also done really hyper location specific curation for a lot of it. Like a lot of the programs I've seen you do, a lot of the things that you and I have worked on together have all been for artists who are... Um, actively living and working um, in Africa. And tell me a little bit more about getting into that in the first place. Because I know your passion for art and really actually poetry and literature all came first. And then once you had a bit more of a platform and were able to kind of shine a light on other artists, you've, your art has always spoken about, you know, kind of social commentary of being African today. And you've done a lot of work to also make sure you're supporting artists who are from your your you know region as well. Has that always been a driving force and a desire, or has it been something that has been like an amazing bonus of your artistic journey? Well, it's it's always been a desire. I actually see it as part of my practice, really. Um, as you're aware, and every other person is aware, um, Africa has its problem, which um, uh, I mean. So many problems, right? And some of these problems are preventing um, artists who are working out of Africa from actually making it in their practice. Um, uh, uh, devices like laptops and whatever, they are priced in US dollars. And right now, our currency in Nigeria is taking a beating. And so if you're an artist and you need a new device, then you probably have to go rob a bank to be able to buy that new device, right? And um, when I entered the space, for me, I think it was um, a matter of the right place and the right time. And then I found out I was the only African artist in the space. I felt a little bit lonely, yeah. actually. Um, yes, I was telling my stories through the, the work that I was making, you know. But I was, I was also connecting with other artists, you know, from other parts of the world. But I felt lonely and I felt there was a need for other African artists to actually, you know, come in and also take part in what, what is happening. And before Africa here, um, as far back as 2020, 2021, no, not even 2021, 2020, I used to um, organize um, a sort of um, seminar, online seminar for African artists to get them into the NFT space. Not many were interested. This was before the big bank sale, people, 
because um, there is this way that people back home in those days used to view crypto, you know. Mm -hmm. When you say crypto art, they are like, no. Uh, it, for, for them, it feels almost like a pollution of what art should be, which isn't correct. And not many were interested at the time. And so after the big bank sale that was making headlines across the world, they all came back, they were very much interested. And so <laughs> for me, it's, um, it's, it's, it's about bringing other artists and breaking those boundaries. Yes, there there are issues across the world, but for Africa, there are specific issues, you know. Um, there are, we have the internet that, like we're talking about today, the internet sort of broke down a lot of boundaries, gave, a, gave us a lot of opportunities as uh, earthlings. But of course, when you come to Africa, yes, those boundaries have been broken down, but right in front of an African is another boundary that is another um, uh, problem that uh, someone, say, from North America or Europe doesn't necessarily have to face, you know, yeah. to be able to make it in what they do. And so what I do through the, through the work that I do, you know, uh, spotlighting artists is to break down that boundary. Specifically, uh, for me in the space, it was a matter of getting African artists onto curated platforms, not just open platforms, yeah. so that people who trust curated platforms, collectors, could see their work. Also, it was about bringing the African story onto um, the NFT space so that people who come in and ask the question, where are African artists? They can say, uh, this is where they are, Africa here. That's how, why we came up with that, with, with that very title. So it's about you know, opening the doors for African artists, you know, going through those doors and holding them open so that others can come through. Yeah. Well, it's, it's beautiful. And listening to all four of you speak today, it's each of your artworks, your processes are very, very different. Um, and being someone who you know, was the driving force of putting them all together, so much of what I felt when I looked at all of your pieces was emotion. Um, emotionally driven in every way. I felt it in every single one of the pieces. When I was writing the curator statement, um, I was moved, I was inspired when I was writing it. And all I could think about was how wildly different each of your styles are and each of your creating processes also. I know that we are almost at time today, but I wanted to quickly ask if anyone had a question that they wanted to ask. Um, and if there are no raised hands, then I will also say that um, everyone has art on display who's up here with us in the Maker's Place booth. Again, it's right downstairs, um, right as you're kind of exiting um, the stairs by the, um, just outside of the VIP section. So if you want to come say hello, see the artworks, talk to the artists, come and ask me any questions, um, come and see the Maker's Place team. And um, thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you. You guys want to stand to get a quick picture? Yeah, let's do a picture before we get.